topping our headlines on this Monday afternoon. There has been a tangible decline in COVID-19 infections here on the local front and in line with this reality, public testing centres will only be offering PCR tests to those at high risk. And Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky will be addressing members of the South Korean National Assembly later on this Monday as part of a virtual campaign against Russia's ongoing aggression in Ukraine. Meanwhile, President-elect Yoon Seok-yeol has nominated more individuals to shape his incoming cabinet and they include Chuk Young-ho for the post of Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister to battle inflation. Hope your work week is off to a good start. This is the Daily Report for Monday, April 11th here in Korea. I'm Min San Hee. Authorities have announced a significant drop in local COVID-19 infections with cases hovering below the 100,000 mark for the first time in roughly seven weeks. Our issue who has more on the domestic situation as well as that in the Chinese city of Shanghai where residents remain under lockdown. As the wave of COVID-19 Omicron cases continues on a downward trend, the number of new infections reported in South Korea has dropped to below 100,000. The country reported 90,928 COVID-19 cases as of midnight Sunday. It is the first time since the last week of February that the country has reported below 100,000 cases. Compared to a week before, the number of cases dropped by over 30,000. And compared to two weeks ago, the figure dropped by nearly 100,000. Gyeonggi-do province reported the highest number of cases with over 25,000 followed by Seoul. And beginning Monday, community health centers and makeshift testing stations will cease to provide free rapid antigen tests. Instead, only PCR tests for those in high-risk groups will be carried out. Everyone else will need to visit local clinics and hospitals for a rapid antigen test. This week, the South Korean government will announce new social distancing measures that may see all restrictions except for indoor mask-wearing rules removed. Over in Shanghai, 25 million residents remain under a lockdown that has been continued for the second week. But despite the strong social distancing measures, the daily number of confirmed cases continues to increase. The number of confirmed cases was over 24,000 on Saturday, breaking records for the sixth consecutive day. Under the lockdown, residents are confined to their homes and most have to order in food and water and wait for the government to drop off food supplies. Videos of people in the city looting supermarkets and protesting the lockdown have been doing rounds on social media. Meanwhile, a temporary hospital was built at the city's National Exhibition and Convention Center and began accepting COVID-19 patients starting on Saturday. The temporary facility has a total of 50,000 hospital beds. Lee si Arirang News. On the local political front, President-elect Yoon seok yeols latest nominations for his cabinet include Chu kyung ho for the post of Deputy Prime Minister as well as Finance Minister to battle escalating inflation. Our Lee kyung has details. President-elect Yoon seok yeol on Sunday announced his picks for eight ministers who will make up around half of his new cabinet. First to be announced for nominees to oversee the economy and national security. Tapped as deputy prime minister and doubling as finance minister is two-term lawmaker Chu kyung ho who has previously held key government posts in finance. The new government's utmost task is to stabilize consumer prices. In dealing with that issue, the economy-related ministers will form one team. As for Defense Minister, former Vice Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff Lee jong sub who played a key role in strengthening the South Korea-U.S. alliance, the top priority of UN's defense policy. South Korea's relations with the North and the United States are equally important. I believe North Korea policy should see a two-track approach, enhancing our own capabilities and expanding deterrence through the U.S. alliance. For Culture Minister, Yoon is nominating Park Bo-gyun, a former journalist with 40 years of experience. 
Another expert has been nominated to lead the health ministry. Cheong Woo Young, who was in charge of a major hospital in the southeastern city of Daegu, where the country saw the very first major outbreak of COVID-19. A for the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, former lawmaker Kim Hyun Suk, who will also be in charge of preparing for the ministry's restructuring to come soon. The nominee for Trade Minister Yi Chang Yang had helped the country overcome the IMF crisis in the late 90s. A former Jeju governor Won Hee Ryong, who led Yoon's campaign offensive highlighting a land development allegedly involving Yoon's main rival, is nominated for land minister. Lastly, Korea's father of semiconductors, Lee Jong-ho, has been tapped for science and ICT minister. Yoon's pick for prime minister, who is second in charge of the cabinet after the president was named one week ago, former PM Han dok su The 10 remaining picks for the cabinet are to be finalized in about a week. Young Eun, Arirang News. And the South Korean delegation representing the incoming unit administration ended its agenda in the U.S. this past Sunday, having reportedly set up the platform necessary to ensure productive dialogue on issues of mutual interest. Here's Kim Dami. Incoming President led Yoon Sang Yeol's top envoy to the U.S. this Sunday. The era of a global strategic partnership between Seoul and Washington has officially begun and will be rooted in mutual values, including democracy, market economy, and human rights. Speaking to journalists at Washington Dulles International Airport before returning to Seoul, Bak Jin stressed the delegation's eight-day visit marked the first steps of South Korea becoming a pivotal country globally. He then explained that the two sides have secured a groundwork for practical policy consultations through a broad and substantial dialogue. Also discussed during talks were North Korea issues, with a U.S. official saying it was a, quote, back to basics regarding CVID, complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. The incoming Yoon administration is saying that Seoul and Washington will take a reciprocal approach to North Korea policies, meaning the regime will have to denuclearize first. But Bak also made sure to note that there are many areas that the two allies need to cooperate and coordinate on aside from Pyongyang's nuclear issue. The chief of the delegation called the discussions on maximizing national interest during the rapidly changing global situation meaningful, pointing out Washington-Moscow relations are creating a big axis due to the Ukraine crisis. Bak said the first summit between Yoon and U.S. President Joe Biden will take place at an early date once the new administration kicks off and voiced hope over Washington's plan to send high-ranking officials to the presidential inauguration. During their eight-day trip to the U.S., Bak and six other members met with various administration officials, lawmakers and experts from think tanks, including U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and U.S. Special Envoy for North Korea, Sung Kim. Kim Dami, Arirang News. In other news, on April 11, 1919, that would be more than a century ago, amid Japan's colonial rule, the Provisional Government of Korea was established in the Chinese city of Shanghai. In light of this occasion, Seoul has hosted an annual event, ceremony that would be with the Prime Minister and leaders of political parties in attendance. The government has also disclosed a document indicating that the different groups of independence fighters dispersed by war had sought to join forces against Japan's colonial rule. Meanwhile, also on this Monday, a hall has been opened at the presidential retreat of Cheongnamde in Cheongju City in Chungcheongbukdo province in memory of the provisional government. The U.S. has shared a frightening forecast regarding the fate of civilians in Ukraine amid the appointment of a new general by Kremlin to oversee its invasion of Ukraine. Our Kim Sung-min explains. The U.S. has warned that the newly appointed Russian general overseeing forces in Ukraine could cause more brutality against people in the country. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said on Sunday that he expects Russia's new general Alexander Dvornikov to orchestrate crimes and brutality against Ukrainian civilians. Sullivan says the general is known for his brutality in Syria and led forces there which were accused of carrying out crimes against humanity. This comes as some warning signs show Russia could start soon a new offensive in eastern Ukraine, which experts have presumed will be the new focus of Russia's attacks. 
A satellite image released by Maxter Technologies has identified a 13-kilometer-long Russian military convoy moving south through eastern Ukraine on April 8. Watchers say the convoy may be headed to the Kharkiv region, near the eastern regions of Luhansk and Donetsk. Ukrainian officials have said Russia's offensive will focus on two primary fronts against the southeastern port city of Mariupol and in eastern Ukraine, especially around Luhansk. With a potential showdown approaching, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky urged Europe for more support, warning that Russia's target is Europe as a whole. The catastrophe will inevitably hit everyone, because Russian aggression was not intended to be limited to Ukraine alone, to the destruction of our freedom and our lives alone. The whole European project is a target for Russia. His remarks follow some European leaders, including British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, making a visit to Kyiv to meet President Zelensky. Meanwhile, Pope Francis called for an Easter truce in Ukraine on Sunday, highlighting the importance for leaders to, quote, make some sacrifices for the good of the people. Holding Palm Sunday Mass for the first time since the start of the pandemic, he said real negotiations should come to achieve a truce to reach peace. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is poised to address members of the South Korean National Assembly on this Monday. According to the Parliamentary Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Zelensky will deliver a roughly 15-minute virtual speech at 5 p.m. Korea time. The address comes as part of his virtual campaign aimed at denouncing Russia's invasion of Ukraine and rallying support for a peaceful solution to the crisis among lawmakers in different countries. The speech will be broadcast live on South Korea's National Assembly television. Across the border in North Korea, Kim Jong-un marks his 10th anniversary as head of the ruling Workers' Party on this Monday. Accordingly, a special assembly was hosted this past Sunday to commemorate the occasion. Our Kim Yo-san reports. North Korea has celebrated the 10th year of Kim Jong-un's rule. According to the regime's state-run Korean Central News Agency, a special assembly was held in Pyongyang on Sunday, with many high-level figures participating. This comes as Monday marks 10 years since the North leader Kim Jong-un assumed the ruling Workers' Party's top post following the death of his father Kim Jong-il in December 2011. At the session, Che ryong hye chairman of the Standing Committee of the Supreme People's Assembly, highlighted the need to bolster the regime's self-defense capabilities. He then praised Kim for strengthening the regime's defense by putting greater focus on nuclear and missile development programs. Over the past decade, Pyongyang has actually conducted four nuclear tests and over 60 missile tests. Che also praised Kim Jong-un for successfully presenting the new two-track strategy, describing Kim as a, quote, guardian of peace. Kim was also hailed for his great leadership in other areas as well, including economy and diplomacy. Che also stated that the regime's leader has successfully analyzed the global public health crisis, standing at the forefront of achieving post-pandemic recovery. On Friday, the North is due to mark the 110th anniversary of the birth of its founder, Kim Il-sung. Kim Il-sung, Arirang News. South Korea, meanwhile, has been developing an advanced radar system that will be ready for mounting onto a locally developed fighter jet by the year 2026. Our Pei Eun-ji was on site to see the progress thus far. An active electronically scanned array radar, or ASA, is a system that can send radio waves to point in different directions all at the same time, without the antenna needing to move. Useful for the military because this allows the radar to precisely scan large areas and track multiple targets simultaneously. Only a few countries in the world, including the U.S., China, Israel and Japan, have this technology. South Korea started developing this technology after the U.S. refused to approve the transfer of some of its key technologies for fighter jets in 2015. At this research center in Yongin City, some 60 kilometers southeast of Seoul, South Korea's defense contractor Hana Systems aims to develop the radar by 2026, to be used in the country's locally developed fighter jet, the KF-21. This research lab is where the ASA radar system for fighter jets is being developed. The advanced radar's capability to track and detect targets in the air and on the ground is developed here, before it is actually tested on an actual aircraft. The radar system is not visible from the outside because it's covered with what's called a ray dome, 
a waterproof protective enclosure. Because an actual fighter jet flies at supersonic speeds, it needs to withstand air pressure and heat. So this radome protects the antenna and it has a streamlined design to let the aircraft fly more efficiently. Also at the research center, a multifunction radar, key technology used in South Korea's medium-range surface-to-air missile Cheonggung was developed. The antenna spins 360 degrees to detect and track mid-range aircraft targets. This radar became ready for combat in 2020, and Hana Systems plans to manufacture the multifunction radar for Cheonggung 2, an advanced version of Cheonggung by 2023. In January, the company has signed a deal worth $1.1 billion with the United Arab Emirates to export the system. Peunji, Arirang News. A hiking trail near the Blue House that had been off limits for more than five decades due to security concerns has been open to the public. Our Che Min takes us there. Spring is here and people are heading up to the mountains, but there's a new path they can hike this year. Earlier in the week, a hiking trail behind the Blue House reopened to the public for the first time in 54 years. Now that the gates are finally unlocked, people are out to enjoy. I came with a friend who lives close to me after watching the news. It's a new feeling, and I feel good too. It was a track that people could not walk on, so I feel grateful. Our house is nearby, and we came here two days in a row. I've lived in Seoul for 40 years, but it's my first time coming here. The scenery is great, and the weather is perfect. I never knew there was a place like this in Seoul. This trail on Bugaksan Mountain was closed in 1968 after North Korean commandos attempted to assassinate then South Korean President Park Jong-hee. The mountain was partially opened in November 2020 when President Moon Jae-in decided to return the northern part of the Bugaksan Mountain to the public. And with the reopening of the southern part in April 2022, the entire mountain has become completely open. We've been on the other track in the north, but it is our first time on this one. It is the same place, but the air feels different. Hiking up the 5.2-kilometer trail, people can see various places of cultural interest, like the mineral spring visited by South Korea's first president, and the remains of a temple that is said to have been built during the Shilla dynasty. Reopening this historic mountain was one of President Moon's goals during his time in office. It also comes ahead of President-elect Yoon suk yeols plans to return to the public, the gardens, parks, and traditional buildings of the Blue House complex. Choi min Jung, Arirang News. In recent days, concerns have been raised about the rampant adoption of foreign words and phrases in place of their Korean counterparts here in the country. Our Han Song-woo has more on the social phenomenon and a possible solution. Nearly eight years have passed since the parliamentary badge that South Korean lawmakers don on their chests was changed from one imprinted with a Chinese character on it to one with the word kukwe, meaning National Assembly, written in Hangul, the Korean alphabet. But still, it's not hard today to find words from other languages, especially English, used instead of Korean words with the same exact definition. And in some cases, this overuse of foreign language is harming communication. I was at a subway station one day when I noticed a button on the wall with the English word emergency on it. In an urgent situation, how are people who don't know English supposed to know whether to press it or not? It reflects a lack of consideration for public safety. Activists say the overuse has increased recently, with the COVID-19 pandemic introducing English medical terms previously unheard of in Korea, like cohort and booster shot, which at one point on public platforms weren't translated into Korean but simply pronounced as such, kohotu and busuto shot. At first, we started using those words without much thought before realizing that it wasn't an appropriate method of conveying accurate and necessary medical information to the ordinary public. At a glance, it's easy to brush it off as yet another example of globalization. After all, private businesses have already made wide use of such words for marketing purposes, to export goods and services. It's a tad uncomfortable for us, the oldies, but that's where the world is going, and we should follow it. 
It's always beautiful to see when people try to keep up with the time in some way, you know, like um, since uh, like business nowadays is more and communication also is more like a, English based, let's say like this, like you have to relate to more people like it's good. But some people say the unnecessary adoption of foreign expressions may prevent a country's mother tongue from being preserved properly. But uh, when you substitute uh, a word that you already have in another language like English, for example, maybe it's the same thing we were talking about. We are losing our roots. Some experts have even gone as far as to say the trend displays a wrong sense of cultural and linguistic inferiority. A culture of self-shaming for not being able to read and write Chinese characters existed among the Korean people for 500 years during the Joseon dynasty until the Japanese occupation. That attitude of ostracizing those who don't know how to use them, that linguistic subservience is now being shown towards English. On a similar note, the National Institute of Korean Language sees the blind admiration of all things foreign as what needs to be addressed, especially in the public sector, responsible for representing the entire population, not just people skilled at a certain language. We believe the reason behind the overuse of foreign expressions in Korean society is the common perception that using them displays a higher intelligence and looks more refined and new compared to when just using Korean words. The institute regularly reviews government documents for any misguided use of foreign languages and cautions of the social confusion it may bring. A prime example it gives can be found near the entrance of a few public transit facilities near Seoul. Here at Dongtan Station, rather than using a Korean term, this parking space used by cars for brief stops to drop off or pick up train passengers has the initials K and R for kiss and ride written on it, a colloquial English expression that many Koreans have never even heard of. K and R. Kiss and ride, I was saying, you know, she was I say, in response to rising pressure to fix them, many stations have since changed their kiss and rides to Hwansung Jongcha Guyok, which translates to transfer stop area in Korean, but other cases remain unfixed. In fact, even online on government websites. Like the English word archive spelled out in Korean instead of a corresponding Korean term. <laughs> the Hangul Culture Solidarity believes the trend violates the Framework Act on National Language, which requires public institutions to prepare public documents in Hangul in accordance with language norms, using terms and sentences that ordinary citizens can easily understand. That only 20% of the population doesn't know a certain foreign word doesn't mean that they should be left behind. That 20% are fellow Korean citizens who have the right to know like everyone else. Communicating with them in a language they don't understand would be the same as bombarding them with nonsense. To them, it's an insult. So then, what is the solution? Well, experts say that a complete purification of the Korean language to only use words of exclusively Korean roots is not the way to go. They say it's impossible anyway, considering a vast portion of the Korean dictionary is made up of words derived from Chinese characters. There are a ton of Korean words derived from Chinese characters that we're comfortably using in our daily lives. We can't suddenly change words like hakkyo, which means school, or jihachor, which means subway. The National Institute of Korean Language openly accepts the wide use of Chinese character-based words that have already become a part of the Korean language and do not strain public communication. Rather, they believe the answer lies in keeping the Korean language alive and well by moderating where and when foreign words and expressions are used. In other words, treating them as an alternative, not a substitute. Koreans' daily lives should, of course, be conducted in their mother tongue. 
But to welcome and accommodate foreign tourists, we should write foreign translations on signs and documents side by side. Side by side, but Korean first, then English, Chinese characters, or Japanese. There's no need to mix them all up. A tough task that will demand a delicate balance between an appreciation for the uniqueness of the Korean language and an open mind towards the increasing integration of cultures from around the world. Han sung Arirang News. In our panel discussion on this Monday afternoon, we touch upon the prospects of Seoul's ties with Tokyo under a new South Korean administration, as President-elect Yoon suk yeol has highlighted the importance of enhancing bilateral relations to ensure regional security and prosperity. For more, I have Professor Min Jong-hoon from the Korean National Diplomatic Academy. Welcome back, Professor Min. My pleasure. I also have Professor Sachio Nakato at Mitsumeika University. Professor Nakato, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much for your invitation. Right, Professor Min, we'll start here then. The incoming UN administration has pledged a future-oriented approach to ties with neighboring Japan. How do you explain this stance? Yes, um, the campaign pledges of the president-elect to show that his administration um, want to build their future-oriented relationship with Japan uh, based on the correct or accurate perception of history. Right? And uh, he confirmed the pledges during the press conference, which was held right after his election victory. And uh, specifically, he said that he want to build a future-oriented relationship with Japan. And he also mentioned that um, it is important to find out what will be beneficial to both countries and their people in the future rather than in the past. And then the Japanese prime minister congratulated the president-elect on his election victory and also expressed expre uh, expectations about improving the relationships uh, between the two countries. So it seems that um, the two countries could have a better opportunity to improve their relationship in the coming years. However, considering that there have been big gaps uh, in the two countries' positions of uh, historical and territorial issues, such as uh, wartime, forced labor, and combat women issues, uh, Japan's climbs on Dr. Island, the Japan's push for the UNESCO heritage designation of South Mine, and the Japan's history textbook issues, and others. So we need to see how they will be able to narrow down such a big gaps in the coming months and years. Pretty top top questions. Right, they are, they are. Professor Nakata, some pundits have praised the shift in stance by the incoming conservative administration here in South Korea, calling it timely as the world currently ho faces a host of geopolitical concerns, including an assertive China and an aggressive Russia. Speaking within your capacity as a scholar, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that's a good for Japan, actually. Uh, uh, considering the uh, statement by uh, President-elect Yoon, as well as uh, policy advisor to you, Mr. Yoon, they emphasize the importance of us alk alliance, as well as us alk japan trade cooperation, and including uh, japan alk uh, cooperation, or even over security issues. It might be good for Japan to deal with all these problems. And actually, if Japan and South Korea establish uh, cooperation, uh, promote cooperation, that would be uh, very uh, beneficial for both of the country to deal with such uh, geostrategic uh, issues. Right. Professor Nakato, then, beyond your personal thoughts, what has been the response, general response, over in Japan to President-elect Yoon suk yeols calls for a boost in bilateral ties? Okay. Uh, in Japan, generally speaking, the, uh, the attitude of uh, President-elect uh, uh, Yoon is accepted as positive. Uh, I hate to say, uh, but like general understanding of uh, uh, the Moon administration it's not that positive, as you know. Uh, many people consider that the Moon administration is more like a pro-North Korea, pro-China, and anti-Japan. I do not think that that is the case, but that seems more like a typical understanding in Japan, too. But it's, it's probably the same in South Korea as well. The image of Prime Minister Abe was really, really negative in South Korea. So in that sense, many people actually expect it's a good opportunity for Japan and the ROK 
to change the course of bilateral relations. In that sense, uh, overall, uh, Japanese uh, people, uh, including experts, they think that the birth of uh, coming conservative government is welcome. Right. Now, Professor Min, as you mentioned, the need to improve ties has been well acknowledged by both President-elect Yoon suk yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. But I'm sure you'll agree, as you mentioned earlier as well, that history continues to haunt these two mm. countries. Could you elaborate further on that? Yeah, well, um, basically, if you look around, we can easily see that the neighboring countries tend to have the historical issues like the, the France and Germany and India and Pakistan. So this shows that South Korea-Japan relationship is not an exception in historical disputes between neighboring countries. And the, regarding the um, historical and territorial issues uh, between South Korea and Japan, as I mentioned a moment ago, the two countries have got different perceptions and positions over the issues. And as you know, these issues are long-lasting and they have been taken advantage of politically in both countries. And in addition, whenever uh, these the historical issues emerge, um, that they have got emotional responses from people in both countries, especially in South Korea. Now, it is mainly because they have got the victims and remind them of the painful memories. So it would be very difficult for these historical issues to be resolved completely in the short term. And it means that these historical issues continue to be there around the bilateral, bilateral relationships between South Korea and Japan for some time. So I think that the two countries need to take uh, the practical approach that they will focus on the, uh, the enhancing their cooperation in security, economy, and cultural exchanges while they will just try to the manage their historical the, the issues in the short term. Right. And Professor Nakata, conflict over history has been reignited in recent days following news of recent changes, that is, in the content of history as well as geography textbooks to be used by Japanese high schools in the near future. Would you like to tell us a bit about these recent changes? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, probably this is more like the Japanese perspective. Japan has now changed its position uh, regarding the question of sovereignty of uh, Tokto or Takesuma in Japanese. But as you know, uh, the Japanese government actually rejected the protest or demand from Korea regarding the history and geography textbook. So maybe one could uh, arguably claim that maybe the current uh, uh, position of the Japanese government, uh, including the Kishida administration, is reflected in this uh, decision. But uh, there are some slight change uh, over worrying about the comfort movement issue as well as uh, wartime forced labor uh, uh, problems. But actually, the content is basically the same. The Japan has uh, consistently uh, maintained the same position. Uh, but the question of the uh, uh, Tokto issue, for example, uh, this is more like a question in Japan of uh, uh, geo, uh, no, uh, territorial issues, uh, not much consideration of uh, uh, history issues, unfortunately. But on the other hand, as you know, uh, Takis, uh, no, Tokto is a symbol of Japanese imperialism. Uh, such kind of perception gap, uh, gap of uh, the uh, issue is uh, continued to be a problem between the two countries. Uh, Right, it is. And Professor Min, I understand this next question will be quite tough, but do, what do you propose then to perhaps better bridge the gap between Seoul and Tokyo with regard to the differences of the historical matters? The first, uh, I think that it is necessary for the two countries and governments uh, to be agreed that they want to work together uh, for the, the future-oriented relationships uh, between the two countries. But the edge I mentioned earlier today, it would be very difficult uh, for the historical issues to be fully resolved in the short term. So I think it would be practical again to employ the two-track approach, the, which means that the two countries um, the, will focus on improving the, uh, the cooperation in areas where it would be relatively easy for them to work together like uh, security and economy. And uh, those areas have the same interests for the two countries in terms of the, uh, the stably maintaining the, the secret situation you know, on the Korean Peninsula and the East Asian region. 
And uh, while they will try to try to manage the historical issues and try to resolve the dam in the long long term, so uh, the historical issues will be tough. Ha has it been tough? The, it's tough and it will be tough in the long term. So and to do that, I think first the two leaders in South Korea and Japan needed to meet in person and to show in public that they will work together. Uh, to build a future-oriented relationship between the two countries. The leader level, so the first leader level movement would be very important to break through, to make the breakthrough in terms of the, uh, the relationship between the two countries. And it could be of the meaningful political gesture for improving the bilateral relations between the two countries. And then they could revitalize diplomatic efforts to facilitate their cooperation and manage the historical issues. But the other regarding the meeting up, potential meeting of the two leaders, I think it could take some time before they actually met. It's mainly because uh, the, the upper house election in Japan will be held in July this year. And it is likely that the Japanese government will maintain its hard line stance against South Korea in order to mobilize conservative voters in the election. So it'll take some time before we can see some kind of the actual the progress. Anyway, we need to see what will actually happen we'll in the government. We'll have to months. wait and see that. Yes. Professor Nakato, as Professor Min has mentioned, beyond their differences, South Korea and Japan share mutual interests with regard to regional security and economic prosperity. Now, that being said, what look to be the immediate bilateral gains, the favorable ties between these two countries? Okay, obviously, one thing Japan and South Korea can cooperate is North Korean issues. So uh, Japan has been uh, proposing the cooperation among the United States, ROK, and Japan. And also, uh, Japan was unfortunately suspicious about the intention of the Moon administration uh, promoting like trilateral cooperation among the three countries. But on that sense, uh, probably the boss of conservative government in South Korea would uh, give both countries to promote trilateral cooperation as well as emphasizing bilateral alliance with the United States, uh, both Japanese side and also South Korean side. And also on the question of history issues related to like uh, security cooperation, I uh, totally agree with Professor Amin mentioned. Uh, it's probably a good idea to adapt to track approach uh, to pass it for both countries. Uh, to deal with uh, security issues, economic issues, and also uh, history issues in different way. But unfortunately, we, if we look at the past experience, uh, in case uh, during the Park uh, Kune administration, uh, it was not successful uh, to separate history issues and other uh, uh, issues. And during the Moon administration, yes, uh, President Moon tried to adapt to track approach and uh, at that time, on the other hand, Japan has adapted the linkage policy, so not to differentiate history issues and security issues. So uh, the problem of history issues actually influence the trust between the two countries, and also uh, that also influenced uh, the cooperation level of security issues between the two countries. So again, this is a very difficult question, but at the same time, we have to pursue uh, two-track approach as well as uh, dealing with each issue in parallel. Right. Professor Min, President-elect Yoon seok yeol has also vowed to boost Korea's strategic mm. alliance with the U.S. to ensure peace and stability within the Korean Peninsula and elsewhere. This is something that Professor Nakata also spoke about. Having said that, do you suppose Washington may perhaps seek to play a more active role in promoting ties between Seoul and Tokyo as it seeks perhaps a tougher stand or regional stand against mm. an assertive China and perhaps Pyongyang's provocations? Yes, I think so. Uh, the first regarding the South Korea-U.S. Uh, relations, I think that the next uh, South Korean government is likely to strengthen the RK us alliance. And uh, it will be more clear and uh, consistent in its overall the, uh, the positions between U.S. and China. And uh, specifically, the campaign pledges of the president-elect show that um, his administration will reconstruct the RK us alliance and the strengthen the comprehensive strategic relationship with Washington by sharing the core value of democracy, market economy, and human rights. And the regarding um, its diplomatic uh, directions, the next South Korean government is likely to solidify South Korea's status 
as a global pivotal country to contribute to peace, freedom, and prosperity. So I think these policy orientations of, of South Korea will be welcomed by Washington. As you know, the Biden administration want to work together with its allies and partners to track the rise of China. And South Korea and Japan are its key regional allies um, to stand against Beijing's assertive the, the attitude and Pyongyang's provocations. So it means that the trilateral cooperation among South Korea, U.S. and Japan will be very important for U.S. to maintain its influence in East Asia. So I expect that Washington will play a more active role in promoting the relationships between Seoul and Tokyo. And I also think that we will be able to see more trilateral meetings and dialogues among the three countries in the coming months and years. Right, hopefully that will be the case. <laughs> Professor Nakata, on the topic of regional uh, stability and security, there is much speculation here about further displays of defiance by North Korea, including perhaps a nuclear test later this week. Now, what do you believe would be an appropriate regional response? Okay, uh, first of all, we may have to think about why North Korea is adapting or accelerating its military activities, including uh, missile launches recently and possibly a nuclear test in the coming future. Uh, probably uh, they uh, consider that reasonable responses from North Korea, they miss North Koreans, uh, they consider that the reasonable response to North Korea is actually uh, pressing North Korea and criticizing North Korea in their wording, a hostile policy to, to our North Korea. So we have to uh, explore the opportunity to have dialogue with North Korea. That's the first thing we have to uh, pursue. And on the other hand, uh, if North Korea conducts a uh, nuclear test, we also have to send a clear message that uh, nuclear tests are not acceptable. And the international society also needs to send a clear message that is not acceptable at all. But uh, unfortunately, if we adapt, for example, our economic sanctions uh, through United Nations Security Council resolution, it probably promotes a faster North Korea's provocation in the future. Right, and keeping in mind the concerns raised by Professor Nakato then, Professor Min, what are your words of advice to the incoming administration with regard to its foreign policy in general? Well, it's a tough question, <laughs> but yeah, the, I want to uh, talk about the yeah, South Korea's positions between the U.S. and China. Uh, basically, I think that um, the, the next the South Korean government needed to preserve its strategic autonomy um, the, in its relations with the U.S. and China. Uh, it's mainly because uh, the South Korea's the foreign policy needed to be based on its own national interests, which shows that South Korea should maintain good relationships with both U.S. and China. But as I mentioned several times in today's program, you know, it is expected that the next South Korean government the, will emphasize strengthening the RK-U.S. alliance and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, and uh, the, 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 the strengthening the, its uh, comprehensive strategic the relationship with Washington. So it is likely that um, the, the next the South Korean government will get closer to U.S. than China in each overall positions uh, between the, the U.S. and China or the two countries. Meanwhile, the, I have to point out that it is also important for South Korea or the, the next the South Korean government to maintain a good relationship with China. As you know, China is the number one trading partner of South Korea, and I don't think that such a situation will change in the coming years. There, there will be no country that could ex the, replace the China for that purpose. And uh, the China is also important to deal with the North Korean problems. So these situations show that China is a very important neighbor and partner of South Korea. So as in the campaign pledges of the president-elect, um, I expect that the next South Korean government will try to uh, maintain a good relationship with China with mutual respect. So taken together, I hope that um, the next South Korean government um, will maintain good or favorable relationships with both U.S. and China, although although it will likely put more strategic consideration on the U.S. side in relation to U.S.-China strategic competition.
Right. And Professor Dakata, would you like to share your prospects on the future course of bilateral ties under the UN administration here in South Korea and the Kishida administration there in Japan? Well, uh, I really hope that well, the UN administration and Kishida administration can improve bilateral relations uh, in order for the two countries to promote uh, better, uh, better cooperation in the future. Uh, first of all, Japan has to take one step further to deal with history issue. That's no question about that. Uh, the history textbook issue, the timing was not very really good since uh, the president-elect Yoon showed a positive uh, attitude to deal with the bilateral relations between the two countries. But uh, the timing of a history issue, a history textbook was obviously considered negative in South Korea. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have to think about the, uh, uh, the uh, coming uh, upper house election in Japan in July. Uh, if the Kishida administration win the election, probably it's a good opportunity for the Kishida administration to consolidate its po uh, poli political ba uh, power base. That is also promote uh, the good opportunity for the Kishida administration to uh, uh, enhance uh, bilateral relations. So in that sense, uh, there are uh, plenty of opportunity for both countries to improve bilateral relations. That's what I expected. Right, Professor Nakata, that is good to know, and hopefully that will be the case in the near future. All right, then, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Professor Min here in the studio, thank you for your insights thank today. Thank you. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. This morning, sitting French President Emmanuel Macron and main opposition candidate Marine Le Pen both qualified for a presidential election runoff set for April 24th. Exit polls from the first round of the election showed Macron with 28% of the vote, ahead of Le Pen's 24%. Meanwhile, most other major candidates have withdrawn from the presidential race to back Macron in a move to block victory for the far right. Speaking at a rally for his supporters, hard-left former candidate Jean-Luc Monchon repeatedly asked the crowd not to vote for the main opposition candidate. This comes as conservative Le Pen, running on a platform of addressing the cost of living issues and a pledge to unite the nation, narrowed the gap between her and the incumbent French president. Tunisian citizens staged a protest against sitting President Kais Saeed on Sunday, accusing him of implementing a dictatorship in the nation following his move last month to dissolve parliament. The protest was attended by multiple members of parliament amid a heavy police presence. The North African country's political crisis intensified last month after more than half of parliamentary members held an online session to revoke Saeed's decrees. Saeed, however, dissolved the online session with anti-terrorism authorities calling in the main opposition leader and other lawmakers for questioning. The move has provoked criticism both at home and abroad, with a European Parliament delegation set to visit later on today and urge a return to democracy. LEGO have successfully completed the build of a life-size McLaren F1 racing vehicle, which was showcased over the weekend at the Australian Grand Prix. Comprising of 288,315 bricks and taking some 1,900 hours to piece together, the replica features moving pistons, a functional differential and a steering wheel. The only thing missing is a working engine. Measuring at 65 centimeters in length, both McLaren racing drivers Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo sat behind the wheel of the LEGO model on Thursday before Friday's practice sessions. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Monday afternoon. You might be sweating a bit today as we are having another summer-like spring day, but it's not as hot as yesterday, still much higher than the normal. There are overcast skies, but overall, it's a beautiful day to go for a walk or explore outdoors. The UV index and air quality both are okay, but as strong sunshine is rapidly pushing up the temperatures, highs will be up to 25 degrees in Seoul and Daegu, and then 
23 on Jeju Island. And that brings a risk of wildfires. A dry weather alert is still in effect in most regions, and even there is a dry weather warning in some parts of Gyeongsangbuk-do province. It is especially dangerous in those areas with blustery winds of up to 15 meters per second. So please, if you're out there and see what you think could be a fire, just call 119. But spring rains are coming to kick in tomorrow night and starting from the metropolitan area and then spreading across the nation. After the rain tapers off, the highs will go down to normal again. And now, a look at the weather around the world. Well, that is all the time we have for this edition of The Daily Report. Thank you for watching.